Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters Week 64 Weekly Update. And we're recording early on Friday morning as Stuart Owen is very kindly dialing in from Tokyo. From our own international correspondent. Absolutely. But before we get into it, I will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Full disclaimer can be found at the end. Okay, we have another packed weekly for you this week. But first of all, the news. Well, it was a volatile week in the oil market. So last Friday, after we recorded, the Houthi rebels in Yemen fired our missiles at a Saudi Aramco facility in Jeddah, setting it on fire. We've got a picture for you. That caused the oil price to go up. But then on Monday, we had lockdowns in Shanghai. And what some of the charts will show you seem to suggest that uh, the Chinese economy is slowing, as you would expect, as lockdowns begin to take effect. The question is, will they recover? And then yesterday, Biden talked about releasing 180 million barrels from the US Strategic Oil Reserve at the rate of one one million barrels a day for half a year. And that has caused the oil price to come back down. But that actually is good news because it will support economic activity in the US. Then Biden accidentally talked about removing Putin and regime change in Russia, which the US has had to rapidly backtrack on. And finally, Portfolio Matters now has more than 1,500 subscribers, which is great news. Thank you to you all for watching. So this is a picture of the attack on the oil storage facilities owned by Saudi Aramco in Jeddah not good. So there are geopolitical risks all around the world. So quickly going through this week's economic data, Stuart. Well, I think the the thing to say here is that um, uh, much like previous weeks, the the numbers might not be great, but they're not not that bad. So for instance, UK consumer confidence in March came in at minus 31, where expectations were at minus 35. Um, US uh, Michigan consumer confidence came at 59.4 against expectations of 59.7. And even in uh, Europe, um, economic sentiment uh, came in, um, you know, weaker than it has been, but uh, a bit better than expectations. So things not as bad as um, people have been predicting or expecting. Absolutely. But the I'd also add that the... Uh... US jobs market continues to seem to be very strong. So we'll show you the charts in a second, but the job openings remain very close to record highs. And the quit rate is at historically extremely elevated levels. So people are very confident in leaving their jobs because they think there's it's easy to find a new one. It's a very good point. It's almost like people are reporting that they're a bit depressed when who wouldn't be with this with these news headlines, but Life goes on, business goes on, and uh, therefore the reality in the numbers uh, uh, comes out. So the the first thing uh, to say this week is a a big change in expectations around US short-term interest rate changes. Um, We've known uh, rates are going to be going up for a while, but the number of rate increases and the size of them have suffered uh, a big change. Uh, earlier in the year, the expectation was on debate was about three or four um, 0.25 percent changes. Now uh, there's talk of 0.5 percent changes and uh, eight or nine increases, uh, such that in a year's time, um, the futures market is suggesting uh, short term rates of about three percent. So a, a big change um, from zero and a big change in expectations from a month or so ago. Uh, now, this is a fabulous chart. This is the, the German 10-year bond yield, which uh, we know over the past few years has been resolutely negative. 
Well, it's shot through zero and it's now at uh, approaching plus one percent. But it's not just that uh, level of interest rate or of um, of cost of 10 year money. It's the speed of change of uh, expectations. So within just a few weeks, having uh, gone from negative to positive and now uh, non-trivially positive. So big change uh, in the German bond market. Now, this is a chart showing the ships waiting to load or discharge at uh, Shanghai port. And it, it really is quite dramatic that uh, the, the problems in the, in the world supply chains are not going away yet, um, judging from this, which shows a massive increase um, up to 300 ships now waiting to load or discharge uh, at Shanghai. And obviously with um, lockdowns in China, uh, people not able to work, this is uh, likely to, to persist or get worse. And within those uh, the ships, the makeup of the ships that are waiting, um, well, it, it's, it's the war, it's food and energy. Dry bulk carriers um, up from you know, maybe 10, 15, six months ago to over 100 uh, uh, carriers waiting, and similarly uh, tankers. Uh, other products are less effective, but food and energy, those um, rather vital uh, components of any economy. Just to briefly on the, the inflation numbers, we know they're bad. Here we go, is Spain hitting almost 10%. Germany, PPI, this is not retail inflation, but PPI, just about 25%, you know, one quarter up on, on a year ago, um, presumably heavily influenced by the, the, the uh, change in energy prices. But I'd also add, Stuart, that um, <clears throat> this is pre the war in Ukraine, pre the most recent spike. Oh, very good point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Italy, absolutely brutal, up a third over the past year. I mean, just extraordinary how businesses live with this. It either means um, crimped margins, crimped profitability or prices up. Um, probably, of course, a bit of both. And here we've got uh, UK consumer confidence uh, coming in at minus 30. Uh, roughly the levels of the initial phases of the COVID pandemic. Um, so bad, but uh, not quite as bad as, as people had been expecting or fearing. Uh, UK consumer lending, this is an interesting one, hitting, I think that's uh, 2 billion uh, in the latest data point, which is higher than pre-COVID levels. The positive interpretation of this, of course, is that uh, people are borrowing to spend, the economy's doing well, the negative interpretation is people have got to borrow because prices are going up. Uh, mortgage approvals. Uh, this, I think, is just coming back to, to normal, the, the pre-COVID uh, rate of mortgage approvals after the massive spike caused by the change in, in stamp duty. So, so I think some rational normalisation there. And looking at that a different way uh, in terms of the amount being lent, again, very much coming back to, to pre-COVID levels. And US pending home sales, I think, again, that this is um, uh, after an initial uh, burst and you know, possibly bubble, um, the steam is coming out of the US housing market uh, because prices are just sort of unaffordable, having prices haven't gone up alongside um, long term interest rates. And so this US uh, Michigan Consumer Confidence Survey, so uh, down to 60, pretty bad, but uh, that's the, the sentiment indicator. As we were saying before, many of the hard data points about actual output and the people's behavior in relation to jobs is actually rather more encouraging for the state of the economy. This is the US Case Shiller House Price Index year over year, 20% uh, increase. I'm not quite sure how this is calculated. I suspect it might be somewhat lagging as they use actual um, real outcomes, which presumably take some time to throw flow through the system. So we suspect this is, is going to have to come down. Nothing can keep going at 20 percent a year, um, not unless wages are as well. Uh, yes. And also, as we discussed last week, um, U.S. mortgage rates are rising quite quickly. So affordability has absolutely collapsed. Um, as Keith mentioned before, U.S. JOLTS uh, surveys is quite encouraging. This is job openings. Um, and this is way beyond the pre-COVID levels of job openings. I have heard one explanation for this, which is that uh, you know jobs are being advertised two or three times because the employers know that they're not going to get the, um, the the applicants. So if you want you know one burger flipper, you advertise for three, 
and you, and you, you just hope to get the one. So uh, difficult to know, but uh, not, um, well, that's quite, quite a positive, encouraging statistic. And as Keith mentioned before, that the quits, I think this is unambiguously positive. If, if people are quitting jobs, um, they must be confident, uh, or of course, I suppose, lifestyle change. But I suspect a lot of that has flown through, has uh, uh, come, gone through the system. So very positive um, on, the, on the quits number. And US PCE inflation, um, this is, I think, measure the Fed targets, um, well over 6% now, no more talk of transitory. Uh, this is embedded. And as we said before, uh, the markets are pricing in some non-trivial rate increases now. Looked at, looked at a different way, the core PCE rather than just the headline PCE. I mean, this is even worse. And from having been well behaved for many, many years between 1% and 2%, this is now shooting up. Um, about five and a half percent year on year uh, percentage change. Uh, US initial jobless claims, as, as we've been saying, returning to normal, pretty steady, pretty encouraging. And continuing jobless claims, again, very positive news in the labor market, jobless uh, continuing jobless claims, um, continuing to trend downwards. And this is European Union Economic Sentiment Index. You know, it's fallen, but my goodness, it, it, it's not bad at all at 110 where you know, over the previous few cycles, that would have been regarded as a high number, albeit it's come off a bit. So not too bad, even in Europe. Uh, consumer confidence, mm, yeah, as we've been saying, it's difficult to get away from the headlines and uh, all the doom and gloom. So consumers are less confident than, than businesses. How much that actually transl translates into economic change is a different question. But you'd also say that actually it's well above levels, lows in 2012. So actually not disastrous. Mm. Okay, thank you, Stuart. On to Inflation Watch. And there was no new data this week. So just to recap, inflation is well above the target 2% in all the Western economies. UK 6.2, US 7.9, this is for February. EU 5.9, Germany 5.1, although started to raise rates. UK interest rates 0.75, US at about 0.33 market rate. And this is Eurozone inflation and the forecasts are for 7.4% in March. Yeah, Keith, I just wanted to, to comment quickly on this chart actually in relation to one of the previous presentations I did, um, where I was talking about possible inflation hedging investments, mm -hmm. and I was highlighting um, some index-linked um, real estate opportunities in both the UK and in Europe. And many of those companies have contracts with inflation linking explicitly in, um, so you would hope that they would be insulated against this sort of uh, this sort of resurgent inflation. However, um, people should be aware that there are caps and collars on those contracts. And I think this chart shows where the caps and collars have come from, because they're typically uh, are capped at 4% annual increase maximum and collared at 1% minimum mm -hmm. annual increase in the, in the rents that, uh, for instance, the warehouse companies are allowed to charge. And that, of course, is something, if you look at this chart, which was appeared to be very uh, well embedded over the past you know, 20 years. However, inflation is now bursting through that ceiling. So the inflation protection from some of those, uh, for instance, real estate companies, isn't quite um, how it initially appeared. Mm, very interesting. Thank you, Stuart. Can you um, send us a link to some of those that you were interested in, and we'll share them in the description of the podcast. Will do, yeah. Um, so this is US core personal consumption expenditure inflation, and it is at a 40 year high, and frankly, is on an upwards trajectory. And all the measures of inflation, no matter how you try and trim the inflation number, everything is rising. So you have broadening inflation, as we have discussed in previous episodes. And 
inflation is high everywhere. So this is a map of the world showing average inflation in the different regions. And in some areas, it's absolutely enormous. You look at South America, inflation is running at 43%. You look at the Middle East, it's 25%. The US, as we know, it's 7.9%. EU around 5.8%. Africa, 183 So you're getting inflation absolutely everywhere. That's a really interesting chart, really sets uh, you know, your, your expectations are you know, away from looking at just the FT and, and the US to, mm. to see what's happening in the world. That's really quite shocking, isn't it? Absolutely. And you know, when you talk about food inflation, that's really going to hurt developing nations. And European steel prices continue to rise. Uh, reminder, Russia is a steel exporter. As we talked about last week, mortgage payments and rents are both rising. So this is the US numbers. Consumers are going to be squeezed. Their living standards are being squeezed by rising food prices, rising energy prices, rising mortgage and rental payments. But this is latest data on container shipping rates from China to the US and uh, Rotterdam, and they show they're coming down. Now, how much of a function of that is disruption in Shanghai and lockdown in China? If you can't actually get the, the containers out of China, then presumably you don't need to hire a vessel to transport them. So we can only wait and see. Now, the Goldman Sachs supply chain index on that, or remain on that topic, remains high, but down from its peak. And if you look at the lower chart, it's declined, but remains very elevated by historic standards. And European fertilizer prices continue to rise. American fertilizer prices continue to rise. Reminder, Nitrogen fertilizers are basically 90% natural gas. The price has roughly pentupled in 18 months. This is US ammonia, which again is a component of fertilizer. And that has gone up eightfold in 18 months and is rising. Keith, that's something which is genuinely to the moon, isn't it? Yeah. In the real world, the real economy, hard things that we really need. Now, actually, while we're talking about that, Stuart, we had um, an interesting um, note from one of our viewers, a UK farmer, Hugh Evans, who's talking. Uh, I asked him about whether the rising fertilizer costs were causing a squeeze in farm incomes. Do you know food prices are also rising? So the question, my question was, is his profitability rising or falling? So are higher food prices fully offsetting the rise in fertilizer prices? And the answer is, it largely depends on when you bought your fertilizer and when you sold your crop. So you can sell it, you know, decide to sell it forward at any point. And I think we have managed to help him on this podcast but because he bought his fertilizer early and is doing all right um guacamole prices going through the roof diesel now we talked last week about how there's a worldwide shortage of diesel and diesel prices are rising again so that is very good for the majors because the crack spread is enormous these are european diesel futures we normally get a great deal of diesel from Russia. And the market narrative is starting to catch up with portfolio matters. Suddenly the media is talking about how inflation is starting to destroy demand. And I think this might be one of the most important charts we show you this week. So <clears throat> thank you to the uh, clandestine fund manager Innocenti67 for sending me this. And it shows US consumers discretionary spending intentions for the coming year. And as you can see, 
they're spent in they think they're going to be spending more on groceries and utilities i.e energy and that means they're going to have to cut back on discretionary items eating out entertainment travel clothing etc etc and this is exactly what we talked about last week so this is evidence that the discretionary sector the service sector is likely to suffer a recession in the coming year so after inflation watch invasion watch so this was last week the uh, position of Russian troops in Ukraine. And this is this week. So if we shuttle between the two, you'll see that Ukrainian forces have pushed back around Kiev. Russian forces have withdrawn from around Kharkiv, but then they're pushing forwards in the east. So You'll be aware that Putin this week talked about withdrawing from around Kiev and it appears to be doing so, but there's renewed fighting in the east. Keith, the, the <laughs> only thing I was going to add on that uh, topic was I, I was listening to a podcast where they were speaking to a, a US general, army general, and they just asked, you know, the, the naive question, which is if... Russia used some tactical nuclear weapon, how big would it be? Um, I have absolutely no idea, but the, the bottom line appeared to be that a, a tactical nuclear weapon has about one third the power of the bomb dropped on, dropped on Hiroshima. So mm -hmm. this is still pretty massive and drop one of those in, in a city and you know it, it's yeah. not gonna be localized damage. No, absolutely. I believe the tactical nuclear weapon causes a damage radius of one kilometer. So, you know, that's a very large amount of damage. So in summary, this week's um, invasion watch, Russia appears to have accepted it can't capture Kiev and therefore can't achieve one of its key war aims, which was regime change in Ukraine but is now making renewed efforts to try and carve out Donetsk and Luhansk. There's no sign of the end of the war. And frankly, even if the war were to end tomorrow, I really don't think that there would be any end to the sanctions on Russia. So expect continued disruptions to the world supply chain. Slightly wonkish section here, so be warned. In a normal economy with a fixed money supply, when money is not created or destroyed, it circulates and it's merely transferred between sectors. So money can be spent or saved by either the public or the private sectors or the external sector, which is imports and exports. So if one sector of the economy spends more than its income, then the other sectors must lend them the money to do so. And that means they will have increased their savings. So if we think about a very simple economy, the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker, they each earn a thousand pounds a year and they've each got savings of a hundred pounds. If they each spend a grand a year, i.e. all their earnings, then at the end of the year, they each have savings of 100 pounds. There's no change in their relative wealth. Okay, so what happens if the butcher spends 1,100 pounds? So he's spending, 100 pounds more than he's earning. Well, he has had to dissave. So his wealth has gone down. But the baker, who is the recipient of the butcher's expenditure, his expenditure remained unchanged during the year at a thousand pounds. So his savings went up by a hundred pounds. 
So there has been a net transfer in wealth from the butcher to the baker. So at the end of an accounting period, you can work out, depending on relative expenditures, the transfer in wealth between different sectors. Now, why does that matter? Well, if we split the economy into three sections, to government, the private sector, and the foreign sector, then, and you look at whether each sector is spending more or less than its income, then the exp relative expenditure of each sector has implications for the other sectors. So if we assume that the external sector is in, in balance, so imports and exports cancel themselves out or are unchanged, if the government reduces its deficit, which is the situation we are now, then that means private sector's increase in savings in a year will be lower. So that means the stock of private sector savings will increase more slowly and corporate profits, retained corporate profits will be lower. So corporate profitability is in part a function of government deficits. And if the government cuts their deficits, corporate profitability will be lower. And that's where we are now. So during the um, COVID pandemic, the government massively increased its deficit and the net effect of that was to increase corporate profit profitability, which is exactly what we saw. So now we're going to have partly a reverse of that. And this is the theory in action. So the blue line is personal savings plus retained corporate profits over GDP and the red line is the government deficit. So basically, you'll see that as the government increases its deficit, so the private sector increases its savings. And the reverse is true. So in summary, a falling fiscal deficit will mean a reduction in the increase in private sector savings, which means lower earnings growth for the corporate sector. Keith, that's very interesting because I think we're often used to thinking about these balances and flows in relation to trade, trade wars, who's winning, who's losing, a sort of Trump view. But just looking within an economy, particularly an economy like the US, which has relatively less trade than, say, the UK, this is very important for um, as you've been pointing out, the, uh, the corporate earnings power uh, likelihood in the future. Yeah. Uh, so turning now to looking at the UK economy, um, there's unfortunately some rather bleak news where um, the impact of Brexit, the reality of trade frictions and um, product regulation is meaning that the UK is frankly falling behind that uh, for both the developed world and the emerging world, uh, exports have bounced back and are appreciably higher than the pre-COVID period, but the UK just hasn't. It's flatlining at about 15% less than the pre-COVID levels. It's um, something which even Rishi Sunak had to acknowledge last week might be being caused by Brexit. And this has meant that the trade intensity of GDP uh, for the UK has fallen out of the range um, of the other G7 countries uh, to quite an appreciable level. Uh, this is, is really, I think, quite uh, a structural problem now that the UK will have to solve, um, either via, in a sense, faking by copying and pasting European rules or by genuinely getting its act together and um, introducing uh, an efficient uh, system for things like customs checks and. I'm afraid I don't have too much faith that we've really got on and done this properly. 
In fact, I, I've been rather sort of annoyed with how people like Marc Francois, the Conservative MP, after Brexit started asking for ideas of what we should do. And I, I, I was shocked. Well, what, you, you were advocating Brexit and there wasn't a plan. And I think demonstrably there was not a plan. There was a, a rather, uh, there, was, uh, there was a hope, there was an expectation, but there wasn't a detailed plan. And now we're paying the price of that. Actually, before you move on, Stuart, um, Richard and I had lunch with a friend of ours who works for the National Audit Office. Um, and we had lunch at the Reform Club last month, sweetie darling, which was great. And he was saying that after Brexit, we have to have our own certification because we've opted out of European certification of various goods and services. But we haven't actually created any of the mechanisms to do the certification. And he was talking about a particular good where in order to have it certified to UK standards, we had outsourced the certification to a company in Hungary. So you have to send it to Hungary to get it certified. I can't remember what it was, but anyway, that's kind of a picture of the current uh, UK trade regime. Oh, it's depressing when you when you govern via slogans and not via detail. Oh, it's frustrating. Mm. So in conclusion, UK trade is being hindered by the post-Brexit lack of alignment in standards and regulation. Um, fingers crossed things will uh, get better um, eventually. You know, when all else has failed, we'll get it right. But uh, for the moment, um, times are tough. Uh, turning now to the, the subject that's in all the financial press at the moment, yield curve inversion uh, again. So the, the point here is that if short rates are higher than long rates, this is supposed to be a prediction of inflation. Uh, sorry, not of inflation, of recession. Um, and here we're showing, for instance, uh, the two year, 10 year uh, gap, which has historically been a pretty good predictor of uh, a, a upcoming, inflate, uh, upcoming recession in the next year or so. And here we have a, a different measure of this, of the yield curve, um, the inversion between the five year and the 30 year, where the five year um, is now almost exactly the same as the 30 year bond yield. Okay, and here's another um, examination of a different part of the yield curve. This is a chart we stole from John Authors at Bloomberg, but he's mistitled it. He's called this the gap between the three month and the 10 year. But in fact, it's the gap between the three month and the two year um, yields. Now there's an awful lot of activity happening there where the two year yield uh, um, being a bit freer than the three month rate has shot up. Um, and so the gap between uh, two years and three, uh, three month money is now almost two percentage points. So uh, trying to put all those uh, different measures together, um, well, it depends which yield curve you're talking about. If you're talking about the long end, then yes, there's a, there's a, a lot of flattening and they're basically uh, around zero. But if you're talking at the short end, well, they've gone in completely the opposite direction. Uh, they've in fact zoomed up to, to very high, almost unprecedented levels. So to some extent, you, you pay your money, you take your choice. Um, but it's undoubtedly true that uh, short rates are definitely going up. Um, the question is really whether we can effectively compare them with long rates, given how much distortion of long rates there's been by a, a quantitative easing. I heard the other day that I think it's over half of the long term bond market is now owned by the Fed. So, you know, it's not really a market determined um, measure. So it, it's as ever maybe it's different this time. So more generally, um, yield curves uh, might be useful because there are two plausible causal mechanisms between the yield curve inversion and recessions. But the first is, of course, that, that short rates are being pushed up, um, money is being made more expensive, fewer projects are happening, so the economy slows. That's one interpretation. The other is that uh, investors foresee the coming recession and are looking to, to find bolt holes and looking for places of safety. So they buy long-term bonds, driving down the, the yields there. Of course, it could well be that the both effects are happening at the same time. So in conclusion, two-year, 10-year spread is close to forecasting a recession in the US. 
But if that was to be if that was to play out as it has done historically, then we're sort of looking at 18 months to two years before a, a recession. Um, but heavy caveat, do we trust this indicator this time because it has been heavily manipulated by the Fed? Uh, as Keith mentioned, I'm in Japan at the moment, so I thought I'd take the opportunity of having, of having a quick look at Japan, um, uh, the Japanese equity market. Anyhow, the not interested in the Japanese bond market, which uh, has been called the widow maker. And um, I hear also that some days there is no trading in the Japanese <laughs> long bond because it's so dominated by the BOJ. So anyhow, a quick, quick look at uh, Japanese equities. I think the bear case is well known. Um, the Japan's population is in pretty inexorable decline. Having a look at this, this chart here, um, it, it's, yeah, as we all know, uh, there's, there's going to be a drip, drip, drip away of purchasing power as the population declines. Uh, other reasons to be negative on Japan, um, there's surprisingly little new tech, or at least quoted new tech. Uh, when I was growing up, of course, Japan was the center of technological innovation, but in some ways has been a bit left behind by uh, China, uh, the States, even Korea. Also, Japan, of course, is famous for its lost decades of uh, little growth and, and deflation. But I think the most important reason um, people have been bearish on Japan is the lack of a shareholder value culture where companies uh, prioritize sales and market share um, rather than profitability and don't really regard themselves as being owned and run for shareholders. So that's the bear case. The bull case is that uh, Japan is a place of safety. After suffering through the past 20, 30 years, Japanese companies have very strong balance sheets. So you're, you're fundamentally less fragile if there's less debt on the balance sheet. Another reason uh, to be positive on Japan is uh, my old favorite valuation. Uh, I'm staggered to discover again, having grown up in a time where Japan never offered any dividends, it now offers about a 2.3% dividend yield, about a 16 times PE ratio, 1.4 times price to book, and one times price to sales, which are pretty attractive in a generally uh, very highly priced world equity market. But I think that the most important uh, bull case is that there does seem to be some pockets of changing corporate culture now, I can hear many in the audience groaning at this because they, they'll have heard this many times before. Uh, there's always a sort of false dawn for Japanese um, shareholder value. But here's some evidence that it might actually be happening. Uh, there's been a legal change where uh, companies have to comply or explain um, their ability to achieve certain return on equity targets. Now, this is a slightly different measure from my friends at GMO, um, the investment management company. This is looking at Japan's return on capital rather than just return on equity. And we can see that there has been a pretty major increase in the return on capital uh, in corporate Japan, in particular after Abenomics, um, this effort to, to stimulate the economy through reform, through low interest rates and through fiscal spending. And now GMO have further broken down the improvement in return on capital to look at three underlying components. So GMO have broken this down into a return on capital coming from return on sales multiplied by asset turnover multiplied by leverage. And their point is that the easy bits like increasing leverage have not been the cause of the improved return on capital, nor indeed has asset turnover it's basically return on sales, I sort of margins, which does indicate um, some more attention to, to profitability rather than just market share growth. So how can one invest in Japan? Well, not many platforms that I'm, uh, I'm aware of actually offer direct access to, to picking individual Japanese equities. Um, there are, I think, a couple of investment trusts that are quite uh, interesting in that they're trying to bottom fish in the huge pool of cheap Japanese companies. There are many where you know, the amount of cash on the balance sheet almost equals the market capitalization. The key of course is to, to pick some companies where the management are gonna do something about it rather than just keep on accumulating cash. So there's a couple I've highlighted, AVI and Nippon Active Value Fund, which are trying to pick these 
group slowly changing cultural stories where management are actually doing something about their inefficient balance sheets. They're handing capital back, they're buying back shares, they're increasing dividends. It's a small subset of corporate Japan, but it, it, I think one of the few pockets of value in, in world equity markets. Um, aside from investment trusts, there are a couple of ETFs, or in fact, quite a few. There's some small cap and large cap uh, ETFs, and I think the small cap ones are of interest because that's where a, a lot of the hidden value is because people have given up on Japan. There's not so much research coverage. But I'd also say that um, it's worth for once considering currency hedging if you do invest in a Japanese uh, equity ETF, because part of the pitch um, is that uh, Japan has been printing more money than anyone else for longer than anyone else, and that eventually that is going to lead to a collapse in um, the Japanese yen. So um, normally I just keep my investments very simple, but the Japanese ETF that I have is actually hedged back into US dollars. So you get the movement in the equity index, you don't have the, um, the change in the yen, sorry, you do have the change in the yen, uh, i.e. if the yen falls, um, you're protected against that. Um, we've been talking a lot on portfolio matters about uh, commodities, and I came across an interesting ETF recently. Uh, the stock code is ICOM, which in effect is a sort of one-stop shop if you don't want to be picking individual commodities. Um, it's done incredibly well, so you, you've got to believe that there's a structural story about commodities, a bit like the, the 1970s commodity story. But it, it's, it's an interesting ETF if you do want to make that long-term strategic bet, because it's very highly diversified. I think it's got various caps in place, which mean that it's very spread across different commodities. It's got about 30% in energy, 23% in grains, 16% in industrial metals, 19% in precious metals, 7% in soft commodities, and there's even 5% uh, in livestock. So it's a sort of one-stop shop, and I think the fees um, off the top of my head were about 0.25%, so far from egregious. Um, that, that's something that I'm, I'm looking at, but of course it has to be a strategic bet. Um, it has moved an awful lot over the past 18 months. Uh, a couple of other charts that I came across um, uh, over, over the past week. Uh, I'm actually a fan of, of share buybacks. I think they can be... A, an efficient capital allocation tool if managements are fairly making a decision between buy back my shares, invest in a uh, new product, um, pay off debt. If they're making that sort of calculation, then I think buybacks ca can be a very valuable tool. However, the chart on the left shows buybacks are now reaching um, unprecedented highs, while the chart on the right, which compares um, the value of the US equity market to US GDP, so it's a sort of rough and ready price to earnings, uh, is at a pretty much a record high. And I'm afraid that this is a, uh, a tendency of management to, to buy high and to sell low, when of course they should be doing the other way around. So, um, oh dear. Yes. <clears throat> Can I just come in, Stuart? I think <clears throat> the trouble is the management are incentivized to get their share price up as high as possible because they've got stock options. And so whereas shareholders would like them to buy back their shares when the valuations are low, management is actually incentivized to buy the stock back when valuations are high to try and get the share price as high as possible for their own personal um, <clears throat> payoff ratio. Yes, it is. It's all rather depressing, isn't it? And uh, talking of uh, <laughs> depressing news, here's um, another example of why I think we should all approach uh, financial markets with some cynicism and scepticism. Uh, this is um, uh, some data on the alternative asset class. So this is things like private equity and private debt, infrastructure, real estate, etc. Well, I'm actually quite interested in this area because I believe for a while that equity markets are very richly priced and if I can find something offering six, seven, eight percent, uh, fairly low risk, I'm, well, I'm interested. However, the, the chart here shows why we should always be worried when something becomes fashionable. The, uh, the data on the left, the left hand chart shows the share of assets under management. 
So you can see, for instance, that passive equities are about 25% of institutional fund managers' asset base. But the chart on the right shows that um, despite being 25% of assets, passive equities are you know, perhaps 5% only of revenues. Mm -hmm. Conversely, um, alternative assets, you know, less than 20% of assets under management, but 35 45, possibly 50% of, of revenues in different case, in, in particular cases. So beware of asset classes when they become so institutionalized. Of course, fees are high, which is why um, the revenue share is so much higher than the asset to under management share for fund management companies. And I'd also say that particularly for alternative assets, be careful because fund managers are incentivized to make these assets look attractive because they are not marked to market very often. And hence the apparent volatility of the, the assets is so much less than for quoted uh, securities. However, that doesn't mean that the underlying risks aren't uh, exactly the same. Um, turning to Keith's area, so I'm treading, uh, been treading lightly in, in the energy area, but uh, I was having a look at the US EIA 30,000 foot view uh, on the energy outlook. And if I could sum it up, I would say that their view is, well, we need more of everything. We need uh, more nuclear, we need more gas, we need more renewables. And they've of course been emphasizing the requirements of on-demand energy, uh, which of course much of the renewables are not, are not on demand. And emphasizing what you could call a least worst approach. I mean, you might want windmills and solar panels everywhere, but that if that's not achievable, then you need to look at things like um, de-emphasizing coal and using um, gas turbines, even though gas, of course, remains a, a carbon emitter, it's so much less than, than coal. And the, the map of the world here is showing where uh, coal emissions are geographically located. So we can see the, uh, there's a lot of emissions in the northeast of the US, there's a bit in Europe, but there's just such a heavy dominance uh, in China. Um, it, it really dominates the, the emissions picture. Yeah, we need to get rid of coal. As part of the energy transition, the easiest win is just getting rid of coal. And on that very point, um, this is the, the claim by one of the energy uh, commentators that I follow that actually uh, gas has been responsible for the largest amount of emissions reduction. Um, because what, they, what the, the data here is comparing is if you didn't have gas and you had produced the same amount of energy with coal, um, how much more emissions would there be? Um, also um, in this review of the energy outlook, um, the commentator that I've been following is talking about nuclear having the best safety record per unit of energy. And the point here, of course, is that we all remember the big nuclear disasters um, with lives lost and um, damage done. But if we compare that with the drip, 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 for instance, of um, health problems that are, that are caused by coal, um, well, actually, if you're rational about it, uh, nuclear does, is not the risk that we all assume it to be. And of course, everything within the energy world is interrelated. And here's a, uh, a chart showing how the supposedly remorseless decline in the costs of battery, battery inputs has been reversed over the past year or so as commodity prices have lifted. So the long-term trend for battery prices um, uh, has been reversed for the moment. On a more uh, optimistic notice, uh, note, um, I was quite taken with the Bill Gates approach to, to energy transition, which is to say, well, look, we need some uh, pretty dramatic answers here, but there's no point just uh, betting on one or two ideas. Let's do 101% ideas on the assumption that uh, you know, one of them will work over the long term. So we need to think of this as a portfolio approach. And the particular example that I'm highlighting here is fusion uh, nuclear reactors, which of course are, are inherently uh, safe. And um, if, they, if the technology can ever be uh, uh, made into a into commercial offering, it, it's, you know, it's 
the solution that we all want. So anyhow, um, the chart here is showing investment over the past couple of years has reached 2.4 billion into um, private investment. This is into fusion. Another chart, um, I thought Keith would like this one. Um, if he's predicting a recession to come, this isn't a recession indicator based on uh, energy prices going through the roof. This is looking at the, the loan to deposit ratio for US commercial banks, where historically, if this signal has turned, um, reached a peak and begun to decay, that has uh, historically predicted a, a recession. So the, the idea here is that basically there isn't demand for loans um, from uh, US banks, and that, that's a predictor of uh, recession. Of course, this time could be different. It could be not that uh, the loan demand has fallen. It could be that deposits are very high based on all the fiscal largesse that uh, we've experienced over the past couple of years. Uh, another uh, chart here, talking about markets and recessions. Uh, I think a theme that we've covered in the past few Portfolio, Manage, uh, Portfolio Matters episodes. Um, this is a chart here from the Wall Street Journal. Um, at, at the top, the, the sort of tan color is um, uh, bear markets in, in equity, in the US equity market, and the blue bars are recessions. Now there have been some bear markets without recessions, but almost without exception, a recession produces a bear market, which I think is very intuitive. It's what we would all think. But I know there's been a bit of commentary recently that uh, recessions are nothing to fear, that earnings will, will, will uh, recover and power through. But meanwhile, um, it's pretty likely that you, you're going to get a bear market if we get a recession. And it's been a little while now. Thank you, Stuart. So this is a chart of Chinese entrepreneurs survey, and it shows that they are experiencing lower domestic and export orders. So the Chinese economy doesn't appear to be doing terribly well. Now, how much of that is just due to renewed lockdowns from COVID? I mean, the fear, I think, um, Keith, is that this is spillover from the, the property sector, um, seemingly mm. bursting or deflating, at least. Absolutely, yes. Um, but there's for, as further evidence of a slowdown in the Chinese economy, these are domestic flights. And you see there has been a massive drop. So people are moving around less. There is less economic activity. So Stuart was talking earlier about the US housing market and the blue line is the affordability index moved forward by six months. And this bright blue line is extrapolated using rising mortgage rates, which we covered last week. So you'll see that home sales tend to follow the affordability index, which is now falling off a cliff. And that is potentially very bad for house builders, but also housing sales, buying a new house or moving is a key driver of economic growth. Because when you move house, you tend to buy new soft furnishings, new durable goods, etc. And so if the uh, housing market slows down, that tends to cause a slowdown in the wider economy. And the market understands this. So you'll see that the house builders' share prices have massively underperformed the equity market and are down a lot in absolute terms. But the IMF is still forecasting decent growth for this year. It's been downgrading global growth but the number is still positive two and a half percent. Now, the, but the market, as we talked about earlier, is pricing in eight or nine rate hikes this year. Frankly, I just can't see it. I think the, the economy will slow down before then. They won't be able to execute all of those hikes. The market is estimating that the Fed fund rate will peak at 2.75% and then start to slow in late 2024 so essentially it's not forecasting recession for two years so but there appears to be very little signs of stress in credit markets junk bond yields having risen sharply late last year have come back down again 
although we've seen the recent rise in the short term yields have caused a spike in bond market volatility, which is actually now higher than equity market volatility or in relative terms. So this is the St. Louis Fed Financial Stress Index, and it's showing very little sign of concern. It's currently down towards its lows of the last decade. But if we look at the world, financial conditions in emerging markets have deteriorated. And if we think about a rising dollar, rising rates, inflation, and very high food commodity inflation, that is going to put a lot of stress on fiscal conditions in emerging markets. So all the conditions are there for a, a financial crisis in emerging markets. And we talked previously about how fiscal deficits have pumped up household savings during the pandemic. Well, it's now largely been spent. There is still extra savings in the economy as a whole, but when you break it down by income sector, essentially the bottom 20% of US households now have lower savings than they did pre-COVID, so they have spent it all. <laughs> Regular viewers will know that Richard is keen on cannabis, and I have always been deeply skeptical because essentially cannabis is a weed, you can grow it, grow your own, but maybe I'm wrong. I saw this on Twitter. Companies are selling this pack of 10 Rollies, $70 a pack. So if they can price at that level, extraordinary uh, profits. Uh, well, turning to the weekly checklist, uh, equity markets, well, actually reasonably calm uh, across the week. Um, not too many uh, dramatic moves. Um, all share up at just under 1%, same as Stocks Europe, S&P basically flat, a bit more action in Japan, down about 2%, um, very quiet week for Bitcoin, only changed in value by 1.7% upwards uh, in, in that case, so surprisingly calm uh, in equity markets. Uh, one interesting point to, uh, to note, though, is that uh, earnings revisions have actually turned positive. Um, so that is uh, stockbrokers, analysts, earnings forecasts. Uh, they've been nudging them up. I do wonder whether this might be a sort of energy related thing where the longer energy prices stay higher, the, the more you, know, you have to you know, nudge up your, your earnings forecasts as, as, the, uh, as, the, as that price gets sort of, in a sense, integrated into ongoing earnings. Um, uh, another chart from our friend uh, John Authors at Bloomberg. Uh, just emphasizing how much uh, the bull market has returned, how brief the effect of Putin's war has been. Equities are now higher than they were beforehand. Um, corporate profit margins, we've spoken about this a few times on Portfolio Matters, um, have been extremely high. This used to be a traditionally very mean reverting uh, subject uh, uh, measure, but it, it's sort of broken out and become um, very high uh, it seems impossible to me that, that that can maintain itself at those sort of levels. Now, here's a chart which rather surprised me. Um, it's trying to decompose the returns on the S&P 500 into um, different uh, sections, that is uh, buybacks, dividends, earnings growth, and PE multiple expansion. I mean, if I'd been asked to bet, I would have thought that so much of it would have been the, the PE multiple expansion, but that really hasn't been the big driver, um, it's been earnings and buybacks um, accelerating the overall index level. Uh, here's a, a measure uh, which I think we should all pay uh, more attention to, and that is the depth of liquidity that there is in markets. We're showing here the liquidity from the SPX e-mini futures, and it's very low. But I've seen other measures of liquidity in the bond market also very low. So this, I think, is a sort of forewarning that uh, securities prices in general are very subject to very big moves. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, on to energy. Oil dropped heavily, down 12% on the week as 
Biden promised to release one million barrels a day for the next six months, which should ease um, supply shortages. But in Europe, natural gas futures resumed their rise as Putin has demanded that European countries start paying for natural gas in rubles and European countries have said no. So there remains the possibility of a hard stop in Russian gas exports to Europe, which would be pretty catastrophic. Uh, coal came off heavily, down 19% on the week. So it's been a dramatic week in energy markets. And we will show you the chart in a bit. And that appears to be a result of lockdowns in China, which is the key importer of coal. And uranium was pretty much flat on the week. Now, moving to figures that are important for oil markets. Well, crude inventories continue to drop down 1.1 million barrels on the week. Oil has very strong seasonality and the oil price and oil demand tends to rise as we move into summer. And right now we should be having inventory builds, but we're getting inventory drawdowns, although this week's was much smaller than last week's. Now, US crude production ticked up for the first time this year, up 100,000 barrels a day on the week, but is still below its levels at the start of the year. But the rig count rose seven. And Biden this week was castigating US oil companies for not raising production. So- Keith, remind me, was he castigating US oil companies for not reducing production as he was elected? Yes, precisely, Stuart. It's amazing how a bit of political pressure caused by prices at the pump that causes politicians to change their tune. Okay, so this is crude oil very volatile but you know at these prices this is wti brent is about five dollars high but um oil companies are enormously profitable and sanctions could take between one and four million barrels a day off the market now a lot will depend on how much Russia manages to export via the black or gray markets. But Western companies are fulfilling contracts they've already signed with Russia, but they're not signing new ones. So the impact of the war in Ukraine is not yet fully being felt. It will only be fully felt when the old contracts expire. And this is a measure of how much, how difficult Russia is finding it to export its oil. Essentially, they're having to offer it at a $30 discount to Brent. And in March, Russian exports are estimated to have fallen by about 500,000 barrels a day. If you're interested, pause, take a look. And even before that, the market is estimated to have been undersupplied by between one and a half and two million barrels a day. So the loss of Russian exports will tighten an already tight market. We have previously talked on this podcast about the high correlation between oil price spikes and future recessions. But this morning I was listening to a podcast which talked about how economists had analyzed those recessions and thought the primary driver had actually been interest rate rises. And this chart shows that actually oil price spikes have not necessarily been bad for stocks. So this is the performance of the MSCI world before and after an oil shock. And although on average, the equities have underperformed in a couple of instances, 
1979 and 1990, they did okay. And Americans are driving again, so oil demand from uh, vehicles is uh, back to its pre-COVID levels. Okay, so moving on to natural gas, this is Dutch natural gas futures and down from their peak, rising again, but over five times their level a year ago. So that's a big drag on European economic growth. And this is Northwest Europe industrial demand for gas. And you'll see, understandably, the huge spike in gas prices has caused a drop in demand. So that is evidence that high gas prices are curtailing, curtailing European economic activity, industrial activity. Europe's plan to wean itself, wean itself off Russian gas is to import more LNG from the US. And so Biden signed this deal with the EU, promising 15 billion cubic feet of US LNG to be supplied to Europe in this year, actually. But that means they're going to have to divert LNG exports from Asia to Europe. And the US government is going to have to intervene in private markets to achieve that. So, and also, European imports of Russian gas were about 155 billion cubic feet in 2021. 15 billion cubic feet will help. There's only about 10%. Germany has rejected Russian demands to pay for its gas in rubles and <clears throat> has warned that gas may be rationed if Russia cuts supplies. And Gazprom have been running down their stocks of gas in Europe which makes Europe more vulnerable to a sudden stop in Russian gas supplies. Yeah, Keith, that was a slightly scary chart, doesn't it? It really does look like this was being prepared for, uh, the, the war was being prepared for well ahead of time. Yes, absolutely. And this is the coal price, which had a best part of 20% drop this week. And the commentary is that it's caused by China and the latest coronavirus-induced restrictions in China, particularly in Shanghai and Tangshan, which have hurt demand and increased inventory at mines. And this is uranium, which is pretty stable at recent highs. And I thought this was interesting. So just as Stuart was talking about private sector investment into fusion, well, actually the private sector has also been pouring money into fission. So you see startups concentrating on nuclear energy, have uh, there's a massive increase last year. And I think that's a great thing, given as we covered last week, nuclear has the highest energy return on investment. We should be increasing our investment in nuclear. Stuart. Uh, industrial commodities, well, as ever, um, lots of uh, sharp moves. Aluminium down about 4% on the week. I'm just picking out a few highlights here. Iron ore up about 8% on the week. Uh, the standout uh, was, was nickel, down about 14% as the uh, distortions of the margin squeeze and the closure of the LME um, work their way through. Um, so, you know, some, as usual uh, these days, some pretty dramatic moves. Yes, but a lot of them are up, still up a lot on the year. So here's aluminium, come off a bit recently, but still in a pretty strong uptrend, it seems to me. Cobalt, um, a slightly odd chart, um, very flat. I'm not sure how much gets traded uh, to produce this, this chart, but uh, that's still very high and um, uh, seemingly in an uptrend. Uh, copper having come off a, a bit, you know, possibly again, uh, as with coal, uh, there's some impact from Chinese slowdown but uh, over longer period, uh, still at very high levels. Uh, chromium also has, has jumped up uh, back to, to recent highs. Okay, so here we can see iron ore, which um, is up 7% over the past week, but in the scheme of the moves that it's had over the past year or so, 
that doesn't actually translate to too big a move in the chart. Uh, lithium here, again, um, very high levels, uh, very little volatility in, in this price, suggesting not too many trades are, are, are underlying the, the price data series. Uh, magnesium, uh, very flat, not much happening uh, just at the moment. Neodymium are uh, having uh, come off from, from recent highs, but still uh, very elevated compared to history, uh, which is a story we, we've said on so many of these commodities. Nickel, well, this is, this is a weird fun chart, isn't it? Um, all these shenanigans with uh, the LME closing, it being reflected in that flat um, price uh, for a, a few days, um, a week or so ago, but still incredibly high um, nickel prices compared to history. Tin has finally come off a bit. I think uh, one of the, the viewers pointed this out um, uh, last year as an interesting commodity, since when it was pretty much on a, stat, on a continuous upward trend, but has finally shown a little bit of weakness. Ferrovanadium um, has, has zoomed up again. Can't quite see the, the scale here, but uh, it's been very strong uh, this year. Zinc similarly are uh, reaching new uh, highs as far as the, this chart is concerned over the past year. Thank you, Stuart. The thing I'd say is going through those charts, it seems to me quite a lot of them appear to be peaking. Now, whether that's a near term peak and they'll return to previous highs, I don't know, but evidence that this very strong commodity cycle may have reached a limit. So moving on to precious metals, very disappointing. Gold down 1%, silver down 2.3, platinum down 3.8. Rhodium had a bit of a bounce, but palladium fell 8.5%. Remember, most 50% of world palladium comes from Russia. So the market is less concerned about disruptions from Russia. Gold, disappointing, silver, Platinum has had a bad week and is drifting towards recent lows. Rhodium recovering a bit. And palladium, a lot of the premium from the war has just uh, evaporated, actually. And finally, on to rates. Well, <clears throat> actually, rates fell across the curve in the UK. Now, we talked earlier about how in Europe, the German yields appear to have shot up at the near end. But in the UK, rates fell across the curve. So is that evidence that the bond market is actually becoming very concerned about UK economic activity, something to watch? And you also notice that in Europe, peripheral bond yields also fell. So currently, the market is relaxed about the return of the Eurozone crisis. But earlier, we showed you the chart of Italian producer price input inflation, which is running at 33%. And even though German producer price inflation is 24%, there's a clear differential between Italian and German inflation, which again is evidence of stress in the Eurozone and shows that inflation is again running higher in the periphery. So the Eurozone crisis is not going away. At some stage, it has to return. So these are Bund yields, which have spiked, my God, back to zero. Um, and bond yields are, <laughs> bouncing off essentially an 800 year low. So where's normal? They appear to be breaking out of a channel, it says. Um, so this is the UK 10 year, so down a bit. US having risen quite sharply consolidating those levels. So something we need to watch week on week. And this is the S&P seasonality chart. So we are moving into April and frankly, we're moving into a very strong period for the stock market. 
Okay, Stuart, what were you up to this week? Uh, well, I thought I'd do a slightly longer review, seeing as I'm not, not on the show uh, too often, and I'm a long-term investor, not a speculator, Keith. Um, so <laughs> that's my story, anyhow. Um, so year-to-date performance, uh, I'm up uh, 3%, which I think, as uh, viewers would expect, I'd be less than, than, than Keith uh, with his oil and gas exposure. Um, about uh, just under 1% of that 3% is the ongoing trickle of income that I always like. I like to emphasize uh, dividends and yields in my asset allocation. And uh, in general, I've got a more traditional asset allocation than, than Keith and, uh, and Richard, um, though I do have quite a lot of infrastructure uh, trusts and uh, solar and wind trusts and some asset backed lending, as well as some regular equities. So my activity in my SIP, at least uh, year to date, I've uh, continued to uh, my program of buying a little bit of gold each month. This is really just a sort of insurance against uh, monetary chaos. Um, I keep hearing too many podcasts with people talking about breakdown of the uh, fundamental monetary system. Um, it's a very complex subject. Um, a gold ETF is my hedge against some of that. Um, I have actually been buying some uh, oil and gas. I'm, I very much agree with, with Keith's interpretation of uh, what we're looking at for the moment, but uh, my exposure to it is slightly different. I've preferred a US energy ETF. Uh, as I think I've said before, I quite like the fact that I think that US energy companies are subject to, to less ESG pressure. Um, they are more inclined to be uh, very hard headed and can be more independent. Um, so that, that's quoted on the London Stock Exchange, but gives exposure to the, the US energy um, uh, companies. I've also uh, veered away from my usual strategy of diversified funds by buying a little bit of Harbour Energy, which has been highlighted on the show a few times. I think that's got a really nice asymmetric payoff pattern. Um, and when you look at its possible cash generation, if oil stays at uh, uh, even $80 a barrel, let alone $100 a barrel, it looks very interesting to me. The only other thing I was going to point out is that, of course, it's coming uh, very much to the end of the UK tax year. I was tidying up a few uh, things recently, uh, used, making sure I used up my capital gains uh, allowance. In fact, all I did was, was flip from one ETF to another, uh, retaining exposure to the same underlying asset class, but just in effect, um, uh, using up my CGT allowance and uh, retaining the underlying exposure. Uh, also, um, there's only, I think, today and Monday left, if anyone's interested to uh, buy some venture capital trusts. It, there has been a real boom of interest, which you know, could be seen as a, as a negative sign in itself. Um, I, I bought some uh, around Christmas and New Year, but just to remind people, the UK tax year coming to an end uh, in the next few days. Right, thank you, Stuart. So my activity for the week, well, I was up 0.3%, which is frankly rather remarkable given the big sell-off in oil. Um, so that takes me to plus 14.8% on the year, slightly underperforming the all share this week, but outperforming it on the year. Now, I have an ongoing policy of putting in limit orders above the share prices of essentially the entire portfolio. And I'm aiming to slowly take profits over the coming months. And so this week, I had some of those limit orders hit in Glencore and Gunnell Energy. Now, in both cases, they were only about 10% of my total stake. And I have now put in new limit orders slightly higher up and over the coming months i'm aiming to move to cash i did make one purchase which is a u.s oil service company helmwick and Payne, which our members of our discord were talking about and as biden has talked about the need for u.s shale companies get back to work i think it could do well but the shares have had an extraordinary run, so I've only taken a small stake. And let's talk about some companies. Well, Rockhopper is a company we've talked about several times on 
the <clears throat> on this podcast and it has exploration and development assets in the Falklands that has been struggling to have developed for the last 10 years. Now, a podcast that we like on Portfolio Matters, Rogue Trader, did a video on it last week, and I have been a long-term holder, actually, well, so a long-term holder. I bought it last year at about 5p, and essentially, they have farming out to Navitas, and the agreement was meant to be done the end of 2021. It's been pushed back to the end of March, and we are approaching the end of March. Now, this morning, they have announced that the terms have yet to be agreed, and they've pushed back the completion date to the end of April, but they've agreed most of the terms with Navitas. Now, if that gets developed, Rockhopper is worth a lot of money. But I actually thought discretion was the greater part of valor, and I wanted to cut my Rockhopper this week. And so I was trying to sell half my stake essentially to de-risk my position by taking out what I'd paid and leaving just the profits. Now, I thought what happened was really interesting. So the bid offer spread at times this week was 8.25 to 10. So almost a 20% spread and also the liquidity just wasn't there. We look on the London Stock Exchange website, very few trades going through. And I actually had to resort to selling in tiny chunks and gave up because the share price is moving down against me. I started selling and I got some of it off at about nine and a half. And then as it fell below nine, I stopped. I'm concerned about liquidity. Essentially, you can get out of some of these less liquid positions only when the market is going up. And the market for oil and gas companies is currently very strong. And I was still struggling to sell what is objectively a tiny stake in Rockhopper. So Rockhopper is substantially less than 1% of my portfolio, but the liquidity just wasn't there. Now, hopefully, this, the news this morning that the agreement with Navitas is still on track will cause a rise in the share price. And I don't intend to sell any more. But just goes to show that these small companies, small companies in general listed in London, there's very little liquidity. If you want to get out before the next downturn, you really need to be thinking about putting in some limit orders and getting out. Now, <clears throat> Gulf Keystone Petroleum had its results this week, and this has been a huge winner for me. So I bought it right down here at 78p, and the shares have pretty much tri tripled. Now, last year, it paid out dividends equivalent to 30% of the share price last year. And it's this year, it's intending to pay out dividends equivalent to 22% of the current share price. Absolutely extraordinary. And it's growing production. So of these um, oil prices, it is kicking off immense amounts of cash, and I've got no intention of selling it. So Goldplatt this week announced that it was starting a share buyback program and it would buy back 200 grand's worth of its shares. Now, regular viewers will know that Goldplatt is my last remaining gold producer and it is a gold recovery expert. So it doesn't mine gold. It attempts to extract the gold from mining waste. The management opted to do a share buyback because the shares are on a P ratio of 3.3. So the shares are massively undervalued. And 
they thought that buying back the shares provided better value to shareholders than doing a dividend. It's difficult to disagree, but the shares have uh, drifted off. But I am very positive on the company and am a happy long-term holder. And this is Gunnell Energy, which like Gulf Keystone has assets in Iraqi Kurdistan and the share price has shot up on results from Gulf Keystone. But Gunnell, you know, they've again are kicking off a lot of cash, but they have more problems than Gulf Keystone. They had some licenses taken away by the Kurdistan government last year, and they have been struggling to raise production. But again, I'm holding. Although <clears throat> I top sliced a bit at 190 and I put in new limit orders at two pounds and two pounds 10. And this is Helmwick and Payne, which I bought a bit um, this week, although, you know, it has come up a long way, but I think renewed drilling in the shale patch should see further upside. So that's it. Thank you all for watching. Thank you very much to Stuart Owen for dialing in from Tokyo. In the meantime, please, can you press like and subscribe to the channel? And it is goodbye from Stuart Owen. And goodbye from Keith Jordan. Thank you. Goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages, or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.